Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast. In this series of episodes, we will be talking to historians, game creators, heritage professionals, and others about history, games, and the places where they meet. I am your host, Edward Gafton, and in this episode, I am thrilled to be joined once more by Joshua Gillingham. As some as uh, some of you may know from episode four of the podcast, the first one with me, Joshua is an author, game designer, and editor from Vancouver Island, Canada. In partnership with Outland Entertainment, Joshua is the founding worldsmith of the transmedia Outland Althingi World, set in Viking Age Iceland, featuring his original card game Althingi One Will Rise and the anthology Althingi The Crescent and the Northern Star, co-edited with Muhammad Ahmad, who also wrote A Mosque Among the, S- the Stars, and which explores the underexamined historical connections between Vikings and Muslims. This time around, Joshua is here to talk all things saga heroes which is an upcoming expansion to All Thingy, his fast, his fast play card game of strategic and influence in which each of the two to four players take, takes the role of an Icelandic chieftain in the Viking Age and subsequently tries to take control of the annual gathering known as the All Thingy. Saga Heroes, which is set to launch on Kickstarter on September 27th, features 10 new Viking heroes drawn straight from the Norse sagas, a new blood feud mechanic for wrecking revenge, Kinship cards for scoring extra endgame influence and a new loot card with special abilities. That was a mouthful. Joshua, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's been about a year and a half since we last spoke. How have you been? Oh, I thank you, Edward, for having me back on. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I, I've been great. Um, COVID, uh, uh, obviously, is a challenging time. It's super exciting to be sort of uh, making our way out of that. Um, lots of big changes for us. We got our first kid during COVID, so we're uh, super excited about that. And then uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's a wild ride. And um, uh, and then obviously, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's really cool to see these creative projects that have sort of been um, stewing in the background sort of come to light. And Saga Heroes is, uh, is, is the first of a few. So uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to the launch and uh, to just seeing people come back to the board game table and, uh, and meet together to play games okay so like what else have you been working you know have you been doing outside of like saga heroes obviously you had a baby what else have you have you been like tinkering with working on so so i'm I'm a pretty busy guy i've got lots of energy <laughs> i i'm also a fast talker so you know i try to slow things down here i don't want to talk too fast but um I've, yeah, I've got a few projects on the go so i'm also the author of um a fantasy trilogy uh, the saga of Torn Ten Trees, and it's uh, inspired by the Norse myths and Icelandic sagas. Um, maybe sensing a theme in my work here, Iceland and Vikings and, and Norse mythology. And uh, I finished the third book, uh, just waiting for a pub date for that. And the second, thank you so much. Yeah, and it's uh, the feeling of completing a trilogy. Wow, like I sort of, when I set off on my creative journey, I started writing uh, books and uh, um, I've sort of expanded to designing games, which has been really cool. But uh, to see the last book of my trilogy, um, finished and out there is going to be uh, absolutely fantastic. There's a, uh, a Scottish voice actor who, who narrated the first book, and he is currently working on the second book too. So I've kind of got two. I've got the third book coming out, and the second audio book is coming out through him. He sent me um, uh, some samples of the first chapters the other day, and it's yeah, it's I can't wait for that to come out. So so that'd be great. I've got some uh, other projects uh, uh, coming out in the Alting universe too, which we could maybe chat about uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little bit later. So working on those in the background, and then um, uh, uh, you know once you start writing it's it's you know it becomes your lifestyle so the the trilogy is finished and i'm, I'm kind of looking ahead at, as to what my next uh, series is going to be you know i've started to outline and, and sort of draft um uh, a new trilogy uh, uh that uh, that explores a bit of a different uh, uh part of history so um yeah yeah lots of things going on with me and then uh, you know yeah family life and, and friends and reconnecting and, and playing board games again i will do a quick shout out to uh um uh, uh uh, a new game that I played recently, which was the Dark Tower, Return to Dark Tower, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, massive Kickstarter, really cool uh, uh, mechanic, and so that was one of the one of the first big game nights we had the other night. And so, um, yeah, no, things are great. We're playing games, we're designing games, I'm writing books. Life's good. Thriving, and you love to see it. Absolutely. Uh, is Return to the Dark Tower in, in any way related to the Stephen King novels, or is that just a separate thing? No, and I thought it was at the beginning, but um, uh, 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 what the, this game company does is they'll take games that were kind of um, big cult classics back in the 80s and, uh, uh, or something like that. And so there was an original Dark Tower game. Okay. Um, and, that, and the concept is that there's a sort of this electronic um, evil mages tower at the center of this sort of map that all the players are kind of controlling in terms of regions. And you're, you battle different sort of, in the first game you battle the sorcerer, but the Return to Dark Tower, they've kind of updated it. And um, I'm not a huge fan always of, you know, technology and board games kind of being in mingle just because I, I like to keep my video games video games and my board games as board games but I gotta say um, 
the, yeah, the way they designed the AI and the integration was was absolutely fantastic. Really supported the the physical gameplay. Um, it didn't uh, feel like the AI was sort of uh, you know you know taking over, controlling the whole thing. It really just allowed us to kind of have our adventure and uh, kind of crunch the numbers in the background and and uh, spontaneously kind of create some fun events. But yeah, Return to Dark Tower, um, the Kickstarter uh, it was pretty expensive. But if you have uh, you know some friends and you want to get mm -hmm. together, it's I would say it's my game of the year so far that I played. So. Excellent. And as always with this podcast, anything that you recommend or you, or you talk about your trilogy of books, the game, everything will be available for you in the description if you're on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast. Surely, if you if you click to, to, you know, to read more about the details of the podcast, you'll see all of the links, all of the details um, Fantastic. said there for you. Okay, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the show as uh, as it was... And let's talk about Altingi Saga of Heroes. Uh, when did you realize that Altingi is a card game worth expanding on? How how did that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, from the design perspective, I, I love kind of how you feature the design process in this game. Um, uh, uh, from the design uh, side of things, Altingi was actually a game that when I originally built it was, was so much bigger than the game that uh, ended up being published. And part of the process for me in publishing the base game, um, and just a little bit of background, it's at the height of the Viking Age, you're a Viking chieftain. Um, uh, you're going to the All Thingy, which was this annual gathering uh, of sort of the powerful chieftains. They didn't have a king, so this was sort of the the big political and social event of the year. And you're basically you're vying for influence to to um, control the All Thingy. And so Vikings are arriving, you're bribing them to join your camp. And then um, uh, in the evenings, you're sending your Vikings out to go challenge other Vikings from other camps to home gang or sort of a ritual duel uh, in order to sort of uh, take them out and to, to build up your own strength and influence. So that's the base game. And when I designed the base game, um, uh, there was a bunch of mechanics that I sort of play tested and tried out. Um, uh, and at the time, it just was making the game too big. And I wanted something that was quick to set up, something that was fast to play, something um, uh, that, you know, yeah, newer players would be uh, able to um, uh, approach without getting kind of scared off, but also that more seasoned players could, could play and enjoy. So um, Saga Heroes, uh, in, in a sense, was already sort of in development even when the original game was being created. And some of the elements that was, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of cropping out of the uh, original game uh, or that I just hadn't quite figured out or didn't have the time to figure out, I was able to bring back in Saga Heroes and create more of the uh, full game experience that I was hoping to deliver um, originally, but but had to, to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, you know, it's Design is not a linear process, right? It's a cyclical sort of uh, uh, going around and around. Uh, and so, uh, as a game designer, it was so cool. Um, you know, cutting those elements was was so was so tough. It was literally like you know, felt like cutting off my own arm. But babies. being able to bring bring them back, maybe even better, having more time to polish them and uh, uh, and to, and to make them work into the game, uh, play better has been has been really cool. Yeah, great. Then um, it must be rewarding to like revisit and say, "Hey, this is a really good idea. Why, why haven't I implemented this? Like, why haven't I added this?" Uh, I want to ask you, how does Saga Heroes aim to shake up play? How how does it change the game? Is this like an end game thing? Because I know at least the kinship cards score you extra end game influence. Is this expansion something that you know kind of you kind of keep in play from the beginning, or is this an end game kind of thing? Great question. So yeah, so I'll just give a quick overview of what the expansion adds to the game. And folks who've played it already will be familiar. Folks who haven't, hopefully that introduction gives you a sense of kind of what's going on in the game. So there's, there's four main additions uh, with the um, Saga Heroes. So one is a new cast of Vikings drawn from the uh, Icelandic sagas and Norse um, uh, sort of epics. And so these, these characters are, are more powerful, more influential than the original base game characters and are a nice nod to uh, some of the historical texts that inspired the game. Now the characters in the original game are all fictional. Some of them are sort of like cheeky nods to actual historical characters or even uh, people from the Norse myths, uh, whereas these are actual historical characters. And if you take the card and you Google their name, you will find a saga that they are a part of, which is super cool. Uh, uh, and, and in most cases, uh, they can be a little hard to chase down sometimes, or English translation at least, but uh, it's well worth it. And these, these stories are really cool. So that's the first edition. It's just new, new Vikings that join um, uh, the game. The second one uh, is Feuds. Now, if you know anything about Icelandic sagas, uh, uh, in particular, if you uh, saw that summer blockbuster, The Northmen, which is all about a feud uh, uh, sort of within a family, you know that the Icelandic sagas are often 
rather violent. And uh, it usually begins with uh, uh, some sort of challenge or insult, escalates to a murder, which escalates to another murder. And uh, uh, this creates a lot of the drama and the tension in the, in the Islamic sagas. And I wanted to capture that in the gameplay. So um, there are feud cards that allow you to start feuds with other characters, uh, sorry, other players, I should say. And so if another chieftain um, kills one of your Vikings at home gang, you can declare a feud with them. And mm -hmm. um, the winner of that feud will uh, receive a reward. So you kind of set up a bit of a challenge. Um, however, uh, if, if you uh, get to the feud and another Viking gets killed, you can choose to resolve it and step back and, and sort of end the feud, or you can choose to escalate it to a blood feud, and then the stakes get raised, and the reward for winning it is higher, um, and, and players can sort of engage in some of that uh, uh, in, in some of that gameplay. So from a strategic um, uh, viewpoint, that really adds a lot to the game strategy-wise, and I think thematically it also ties in really nicely. So you mentioned the kinship cards and kinship is a huge factor in the Icelandic sagas. Um, you know, the relations and sort of the familial obligations become uh, a big part of what drives, uh, especially some of, the, some of the violence and some of the drama that happens. And so uh, players secretly select kinship cards at the beginning of the game uh, uh, with uh, uh, Viking sets, sets of uh, Vikings in the game, and they secretly collect them uh, okay. at the end of the game score points uh, for however many Vikings they have. They also score a smaller bonus for any Viking that is present at the all thingy. Uh, uh, in other words, that wasn't killed in home gang uh, in another chieftain's camp as long as they're not feuding with that chieftain. So if they're feuding with the chieftain, they don't get the points. Uh, but if the, the Viking is alive and they're not feuding with the chieftain at the end of the game, then um, they, they score the points. Last but not least, there's a new loot card, and the loot, um, uh, every loot has two sort of pieces. It has a strength piece as a weapon, and it's got a influence piece as a, as a treasure. And the treasures mm -hmm. are all based on sort of archaeological finds, which is kind of cool, um, and they uh, allow you to bribe uh, chieftain or bribe Vikings into your camp, whereas the weapons equip them to fight home gang. Uh, the new loot card is totally different. It doesn't have a strength or an influence value. It just allows you to um, either mess with other players' bribes, which is a ton of fun. We can get into that or cheat in home gang and poison the other Viking. And so there, and there are consequences to that. But those, those are sort of the four main additions. We've got the Vikings, we've got the feuds, we've got the um, kinship cards and the new loot card. And all of those components are modular. So you could play with all okay. four pieces of expansion. You could pick three of them, you could pick two of them, you could introduce them one at a time. Uh, uh, they're built in such a way that they, can, um, uh, that they can be added anywhere. And wait, when you say you can introduce them at any point, can you start playing Al Thingy, just the base game, and then slowly introduce the new mechanics? Is that is that possible? So yeah, so maybe for your first playthrough of the expansion, you just want to play with the new Vikings. So you could do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the second game, maybe you want to try out the feuds. So you could just play with the feuds. Um, or you could just add the kinship cards or just add the loot. Or if you wanted, you could add the whole thing. So uh, uh, yeah, and I do find, um, especially with games that uh, are sort of uh, meant to be a bit more approachable, I don't overwhelm uh, mm -hmm. uh, people. Uh, uh, players who are a little more seasoned, I will not have any issues with um, uh, introducing all the mechanics at once. But if you are maybe, uh, uh, you know, don't like reading through rule books and just kind of want to add things one at a time, it gives you that option as well, which is a designer um, is really fun because, uh, uh, you know, you want to think about not only the, what is this going to add to the game, but what is it going to add to the gameplay experience for the player, right? Think about different um, communities of game players and, and, and different, uh, uh, you know, you know, cultures built around maybe more intense games, or maybe this is just mm -hmm. more for fun and you want to accommodate all gameplay styles. So. Right. And you can add the, the extra cards during an ongoing game. I, uh, hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I guess you could. I never thought of playing it that way, but there, mm -hmm. there's maybe a whole other way of playing the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the game doesn't take very long. It's usually a, okay. a 30 to 45 minute play. So, um, uh, yeah, you could probably just, yeah, if you wanted to add them part way through, you could, but the, the game does go pretty quick. So, uh, 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 in a sitting, you might play one round. Uh, if you get two or three games in, you might want to try out the different combinations, or you might just want to go for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really add a lot of game time to one will rise to the base game, it kind of just expands the mechanics, but like kind of the game length remains about the same. About the same, about the same, yeah, correct. Okay, interesting. Uh, you mentioned kinship cards, and I want to ask you, how. explain to me again, like how, that's, how that functions. Can you, can you have like sets of Vikings who have synergy together? So like, are, totally. there, like, are there Vikings who like, if you have the entire set and let's say they were friends in, you know, in the sagas, or like they worked together, they had, they collaborated, is that, is that will that give you an advantage if you like know the history going into it? 
So uh, you don't have to know any of the history um, going into it, but if you know the history, there'll definitely be some advantages. So here, here's an example. I've got a, a, a kinship card right here. And so uh, this is Guthrid Far Traveler, and she's mm -hmm. featured in the Vinland Sagas, which talk about the Vikings yes. coming over to uh, North America, which which is kind of cool. And there are other characters from the Saga Heroes expansion, like Leif Erikson and Eric the Red, who are, are, are involved in her story. And so, um, yes, yes, there are connections. And the, and, and the Vikings that she is uh, um, has, oh, okay. has uh, kinship with um, relate to the Vikings that there's a little bit of overlap with with their vikings so um there's these little nods and with the game i i really uh, it, it's a historically based game but i didn't want people sort of tripping over the history or feeling like you know they're opening a textbook i really want them to engage in the narrative of the game and so if you know the history or are interested in it you're going to get a, a lot of the references and the nods but it, but it's not so you know oblique that you know if you don't understand the history you're not going to appreciate the, the the game style so um it, it's been really fun to sort of sneak in like little references um here and there some a little bit more directly and some a little more subtly but uh but yeah for fans of viking history um they're going to find a lot in there mm -hmm. are there vikings who um are part of like multiple sets at one time so like can i in theory like not have you not let you complete a set because I've already like recruited the Viking you were looking for? Correct. Yes. So um, there are uh, there is overlap, but obviously, and this is the mathematician in me, so I've got I've got mm -hmm. a bit of a math background too. It's it's evenly spread. So every, every yeah. Viking has um, you know is is equally sort of distributed, but it's true um, there are sets that have the same Viking in them, so only one person can have them in their set. Now that being said, it doesn't mean you can't score points off that Viking. Mm -hmm. It just means that um, if they're in another camp, you're not going to score as many points. Um, as long as they're still alive, as long as you're not cheating with that chieftain, you can sort of keep an eye on who has what. And um, and uh, uh, keep the Vikings alive that way and score points. So that that strategic element just gets so much deeper. Whereas before you're just collecting Vikings, now you're thinking about which Vikings am I collecting, which Vikings are out on the field, which ones are still alive, which ones have been killed in the home game. That just adds like a little more depth to the strategic element. Okay, so um, so how have you curated the selection of Vikings that you know you've introduced with Saga Heroes? Like how how do you decide on the ten that made it into the final game or the expansion? <laughs> Yeah, you know what, and this was obviously some of my own personal bias and preference, but uh, uh, I discovered the Icelandic sagas while attending university. I needed an extra mm -hmm. elective, and so I took Norwegian, um, and that was that was a lot of fun. I have some family heritage, so there was a cool connection. Uh, and in doing that, I discovered the Scandinavian languages section of the library and uh, 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 came across all these sagas. And so, um, yeah, it was obviously I, I couldn't include all the characters i wanted to include that would probably be an addition of like 100 characters and uh, uh particular sagas are, are famous for having dozens and dozens of characters who kind of walk across the stage and um uh you, you know yeah, rise to power and are killed or you know flee to some land or you know something something befalls them so um narrowing it uh, down to 10 was tough but what i try to do is i try to um take a few that people would recognize some of the more famous ones so uh Gretchen the strong is one of the uh, uh the characters we got eagle scala grimson obviously he's uh, uh one of the more popular sagas, Burnt Njal is there too, um, and Njal's saga is arguably maybe one of the most famous sagas. And so there's a few characters um, uh, that will be easily recognizable. I also wanted to highlight some characters that maybe um, uh, wouldn't Please be so do. recognizable. Some, some some kind of deep cuts and uh, I, I did this sort of based on uh, how interesting the character was and uh, there was also a um an element of if they had a great by name I, I love that too so vikings are fairly famous for for having uh, for having by names so like Gretchen the strong right they wouldn't uh, uh, always go by their family name but uh, uh the the but sagas would often reference them as their as, as their name. So I've got um, I've got Cormac the Scald. Uh, he's a okay. bit of a womanizer, and he's uh, gets himself into a lot of trouble uh, with uh, 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 with that. He's got a lot of pride. He likes to compose verses, and and that gets him in and out of trouble uh, several times. There's Guthrid Far Traveler, um, who uh, many people may not know about, but she's featured in the Vinland sagas, which are a collection of sagas that talk about um, Vikings uh, traveling to Greenland and then to North America. Uh, uh, there's actually a book written about her by Nancy Marie Brown uh, that. Uh, just focuses and hones in on her story an amazing i think it's called the far traveler um i'll, I'll link to that one too but uh but she she just as a character is amazing i had to had to highlight her um there's hervor the fierce now hervor um is in the saga of hydric the wise and the most uh, popular english translation is actually done by christopher tolkien who's uh, okay. uh jr tolkien's son and so um uh yeah now, hervor um uh, is to me, the more interesting character, Hydric. To me, I can kind of take or leave Hydric, but Hervor is his mother, and she is wild. She like, as a teenager, dresses up like a Viking, gets her own band of Vikings, and goes and starts pillaging and raiding uh, uh, different villages. Um, she's the granddaughter of Angantyr the Berserker, and Angantyr the Berserker is also uh, one of the featured characters. He's uh, 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 just a big, tough baddie. The sagas have nothing good to say about him, but I tell you, it's a ton of fun. 
bribe him to join your camp and then to sort of intimidate all the other uh, people. He's got this cursed sword um, that Hervor actually digs up his barrow, marches in and like wakes up his ghosts and demands that uh, he gives her this uh, uh, cursed sword. Um, so there, there's, just, there's so much going on there. Uh, you got Leif Erikson and Eric the Red. And so Eric the Red and Leif Erikson are, are probably well known outside of the community of people who like uh, uh, Viking sagas, just because, especially in North America, uh, you know, they're, they're seen as some of the first Europeans to make contact with uh, with North America and make that transatlantic journey. So uh, Eric the Red was an outlaw from Norway. He got outlawed for killing people, came to Iceland, surprise, surprise, kills some more people, gets outlawed again, and then ends up uh, uh, becoming one of the most influential Viking settlers in Greenland. Uh, and his son, Leif Erikson, uh, is one of the ones in Vinland Saga who ends up uh, trekking across to um, uh, to, to North America. Yeah, his uh, son, Thorstein, was also uh, married to Gudleif Far Travel. He unfortunately succumbs to illness, but uh, uh, Gudrid uh, goes on many journeys um, uh, and uh, is part of that narrative as well. And the last but not least, maybe a bit of an, uh, of an odd duck, but I, I couldn't resist including him, um, was uh, uh, Arrow Odd. Um, uh, now, Arrow Odd is this semi-mythic figure who's probably the least historical out of the out of the batch that uh, sort of I've sort of selected. But his story is just it would make the greatest cinematic like Hollywood action film of all time. And he, uh, 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 he, as part of the story sort of gets old and then is like rejuvenated as like a youth several times. And so his story stretches over um, uh, more than a regular lifetime, but it's interwoven with um, other characters. So for example, he faces uh, the uh, berserker Angantir and Angantir's 12 brothers who are all berserkers uh, on the small island and actually ends up dealing Angantir's death blow. So there's just all these sort of like, you, you know, you don't need to know these to play the games, mm -hmm. uh, the game, but there, there's all these sort of interlinkings and, and, and references that's just like, to, as somebody who loves history and games, is, is, I love that sort of thing. And uh, uh, people may pick up on that, they may not, but um, uh, from a game designer, uh, just embedding that and planting those seeds for players to discover is, is super fun. And and do your heroes' personalities also feature in in the game itself, or how? So, like you mentioned that you have a Viking who's a womanizer. Are there like stats <laughs> related to that? As are there abilities? I, I know there's no abilities in in the game per se, but like, is there any impact on on so the game? The two stats that every character have are strength and influence. So their 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 reflection, uh, reflect uh, the their traits are sort of reflected in that strength and influence value. Um, I, I played around with adding some stats or even like being able to equip Vikings with uh, 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 with different items. But at some point in time, you know, I, I realized, you know, this is not going to be a three or four hour play right. game. You know, this is not like a, a TTRPG or anything like that. It's it's you know, so you kind of work within the confines of the design. And I I think the um, uh, uh, yeah players will, will sort of get a sense of who they were in the sagas based off their those two sort of basic stats but of course there's always the narrative uh, when people sit down at the, the table of the vikings they like and you know um grudges they have for home games that were fought so i'm sure all those things will get worked into uh uh the story of people's games as they play it mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you know the last hero that you've included is kind of like a myth mythic figure um how much of these heroes as legends is based in fact and how much can we trust the sagas as historical sources because i know it's a bit you know not great in terms of accuracy. You know, it's a really good uh, point you bring up. And in fact, that the sagas were seen as almost entirely um, uh, sort of fable or myth uh, in, in most academic circles until about the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, it partly had to do with sort of revived interest in, um, in those sagas. It probably had to do with some uh, new sort of archaeological and uh, uh, kind of historical um, uh, dating techniques. But um, uh, uh, much more of the sagas uh, is, has proven to be accurate than uh, than not, less surprisingly. So one of the big um, sort of catalysts in making that happen was the discovery of the settlement at Lonsal Meadows, which, if you're not familiar with, is in Newfoundland in Canada, and it's um, um, the only undisputed site of uh, um, sort of a, a Viking presence in in North America. There's claims of other places that Vikings may have been, um, mm -hmm. but there's uh, there's evidence there, and 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 um, a lot of folks think maybe they uh, just landed there or have an understanding they landed there and then left. But there's evidence on that site that they had maybe used it over the span of 20 to 40 years, uh, and that may have been a regular site, not a sort of permanent residence, but sort of a stop where they could repair their boats, uh, 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 refuel and resupply, which just opens up a whole new world of questions, right? And so um, we're in an age now where um, uh, uh, there's kind of a revived interest in um, um, Iceland and Vikings again, mm -hmm. and um, there's some some interest in and. In, in, um, energy being put towards uh, researching that. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what they'll, they'll find. Iceland is also uh, geographically rather interesting with the volcanoes. And um, uh, there's very few trees. A lot of the layers of ash will keep 
um, let's say like homesteads and stuff preserved well beyond uh, the time where they would in, uh, let's say mainland Europe. Um, so even the, uh, you know, ecology of Iceland itself has helped pre preserve some of these sites and um, they're continually finding sites that are referenced in the sagas, which, you know, um, our, our tales recorded, you know, 800 years ago that actually happened, you know, 1,000 to 1,100 years ago. Um, and they're finding these sites that are referenced in the sagas, which is super exciting. So, um, you know, the answer to how historically accurate are they? Probably more than we would give them credit for uh, okay. initially, and, and, and uh, um, which, which, at least to me, you know, gives me so much more appreciation for um, the characters in the sagas, uh, the people who recorded them, uh, the people who continue to work to translate them and dig up archaeological evidence. All of that sort of gets tied into the gameplay here as you, you are really stepping back in time, right? You're stepping into their, their mm -hmm. era. Uh, speaking about stepping back in time, um, my final question to kind of wrap up the Saga Heroes segment is, what have you learned from making Ulthingy that has gone on to inform the expansion Saga Heroes? So what lessons have you taken from your first Kickstarter project into the second one? Oh, you know what? That's a really good question. Um, I think what the uh, original Kickstarter for the base game, All Thing in One Will Rise, taught me is what got people really excited, what people loved about the game. And um, uh, like I said, I have all sorts of mechanics. Um, uh, one that I still haven't been able to work in that I would love to at some point is like an outlawry uh, mechanic where Vikings get outlawed, but then you can play, pay their sort of their rare guild or their blood price and, and mm -hmm. sort of buy them back in society. Um, that, that just didn't end up working out. But by seeing what people got excited about for the base game, that let me sort of hone and focus what the expansion was going to be on. Um, uh, if there was, uh, uh, you know, things that people were asking for. Uh, um, so uh, some people wanted, uh, you know, they enjoyed the game, but they wanted a little bit more depth of strategy. I was able to introduce that. And uh, uh, it's really amazing, amazing feedback. Playtesting as a process is is really important in game design, uh, but there's nothing quite like having a fully developed game, uh, you know, present and then being able to build on top of that. Because when you start designing a game, you're really just sort of building an island in an ocean, right? There's no, you, you really have to work hard to kind of get a solid um, uh, grounding for it. Whereas when you do an expansion, you're working off a game that, it, you know, in theory is already balanced, has been play tested really well. And it's, uh, uh, um, I'm not going to say, it's easier in a sense to sort of build on top of something that already exists mm -hmm. than to create something entirely new. Right. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, I kind of know the answer, but I want to hear your take uh, on it is how did you find the reaction to all things, the critical reaction, the public reception, how have you found, you know, like players, like actually, you know, buying your game, playing your game. How, how was that entire process? Uh, I, personally, uh, honestly, just totally blown away. I, um, uh, you know, I had a really clear vision for what I wanted for this game. I was actually involved in, I didn't do the art, but I commissioned the art. I did all the layout mm -hmm. and design. And so, which is not typical. Typically designers will just come up with a concept, throw it at a publisher. The publisher will kind of take care of the visuals and all that sort of thing. So, so it was sort of, it was sort of extra affirming to me to see that people love the, the look of the game. Um, uh, there was some uh, incredible sort of, uh, 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 you know, accolades from, from folks I would have never, um, so for example, like the Saga Thing podcast, uh, uh, um, uh, Andy from the Saga Thing podcast was a huge fan of the game. He actually was just in Iceland, um, taking a, a tour there and brought his copy of the game. He was at Thing of Miller and put it on the table. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, oh, I got to play all thingy while I'm in Iceland. And so, you know, to see the game sort of reach that far. Um, I know, um, some of the work that I've done with Outland, uh, another project, Old Norse from Modern Times, which is sort of a humorous phrase book for, uh, for Old Norse, uh, showed up, uh, um, a fellow um, author and friend who I have more to say about later, uh, Katie Felix, um, who wrote as part of the anthology, was in was in the UK, and it was featured in the Jorvik Viking Museum, and so that was that was in their their, their front window, and so she's texting me pictures, and I'm like, wow. So um, yeah, the response has been uh, 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 very positive, and obviously, you know, when creators put things out on the internet, it's a little bit scary. You worry, you know, are people mm -hmm. gonna troll me, or are they gonna bad bad comments? And um, I, to be honest, I, I I've lucked out. I think in a sense that uh, you know it, it's been very positive. I'm sure there's folks who've liked it who've not liked it, but in general, um, uh, yeah, the reception has been big. One of my focuses for the game was was historical Vikings, not you know these fantasy D and D Vikings with um, you know big horn helmets or uh, uh, you know Conan the Barbarian style axes or, or you know that sort of this, thing. Yeah. And, and it, that has really resonated with folks too. And I love that you highlight the sort of intersection between history and games here. Um, that's uh, there's obviously interest in that. So yeah, I remember us talking about it like a year and a half ago about like how it, this is you know I think it's meant to be a true Viking game to be representative of like how Vikings were not what we wanted them to be or what we expected them to be, you know, based on like stereotypes, Hollywood, whatever. Right. Um, right. You, you mentioned playtesting and we spoke kind of before the recording about, you know, returning to a more normal life, but how has, 
you know, you launched Altingi in in the midst of the pandemic. Now we kind of at I want to say at a later point in the pandemic, we're like, you know, we are able to go to conventions, we are able to play test games, we're able to, you know, get together again. How has returning to a more normal life affected playtesting or, you know, the reception to the game? And have you attended any games, uh, any conventions with Old Thingy? Or are you looking to attend any? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I totally agree with you. It's like it's it's sort of like there's an emergence now. Um, people are coming back to the game table. Playtesters are are kind of coming out of the woodwork. Uh, and for me, that's definitely uh, in the early stages of that process. I wouldn't say that's sort of fully up and running. But but yeah, the, the game design group I run here on Vancouver Island is starting to 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 get together and test games again, which is fun. And um, I haven't been to a con yet, but I've got two booked for the end of September. So I'll be at uh, Capital City Comic Con in Victoria, BC, Canada. Here, um, uh, I think the 23rd or the 20th, no, the 24th of September. And then I'll be in uh, at Shucks, which is Canada's biggest game convention in Vancouver. That'll be on the 30th. And so I'll be there at, uh, in India. Uh, uh, featuring the game, people can come by and see the expansion, play the base game, um, and come chat with me. So uh, I, I really, as somebody who sort of thrives off that social energy, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to connecting with fans, connecting with people who love games, and um, being able to show them something physically and not just, you know, uh, on a screen. Mm -hmm. And I still... Uh, keeping in touch with the people whom you've connected with online during the pandemic. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I remember us speaking about playtesting online. Are you still in touch with those people? Are those online playtests play still happening? Yes. So um, I, I ended up using Tabletop Simulator, which a lot of yeah. game designers will use to, to play desk games. And you can actually create, not, you can play games that already exist, but you can also create your own. So that, that was a, that was a huge sort of um, uh, stopgap for me. Um, I, I, I enjoyed the process. I'm glad I learned um, uh, how to do that. A lot of publishers want to do that. Um, I know mm -hmm. uh, in addition to some European publishers, um, that was just, they wanted to sit down at a table, but that is obviously kind of the, the best kind of go between is, is to do that. I find as a designer, um, not that it's not valuable. I think it is valuable, but uh, the reactions on people's faces, um, you know, the, the energy in the room, the sensor on the table, seeing how people physically handle the pieces, if it's clunky or if it works well, is helpful for me. So um, I think it's a great uh, option and a great tool. And for some games, uh, might be um, even maybe the best way to play test. Uh, but for me, I'm definitely looking forward to returning to sort of in-person um, um, play tests where, uh, you know, we're dealing with physical components and uh, uh, kind of like sensing the, the, the physical presence and social atmosphere uh, around the table. So, um, yeah, valuable for sure. I, I am looking forward to definitely shift back towards more in-person play testing. Mm -hmm. And is there a way for people interested in all things it's played on Tabletop Simulator? Is there a mod? Is there an official version? Great question. Not yet. Um, there's lots of things happening with the All Thingy universe, and uh, I can foresee that sort of becoming something that happens eventually. Uh, but but as of right now, yeah, no, no. Uh, there's there's only the only the physical version. Okay, but thinking about it still, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even I personally have not had a chance to play All Thingy despite <laughs> talking to you for so how for this long, and I'm like, okay, tabletop simulator might actually be like a good good opportunity, but um, might actually work to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, let's let's move to the broader old thingy universe. I mentioned in the introduction that this is a transmedia cross project, you know, endeavor. Um, when did you know you wanted old thingy to become, you know, again this transmedia multi project multi project venture? How how did you envision this to go? Yeah, so so and just to provide some definitions, if folks aren't familiar with what transmedia means, so transmedia is sort of this. Um, I want to, I'm not going to say it's a new concept in publishing, but it's definitely sort of um, uh, being sort of revived as more of a of a way to do to do games. Uh, but the idea is to provide not just a game, but like a world, right? So um, uh, when I think it came out, my, my original concept was just a game, uh, and when I published through Outland Entertainment, one of their uh, big um, ideas with their worlds, and this has happened with Viking Verse, with Ian Stewart Sharp. This has happened with a few of their other Apex. They're sort of their prehistoric dinosaur um, type world. Is that you take a game and you sort of build a world out of it. So All Thingy was sort of the the initial seed from which the All Thingy universe is, is kind of growing. Um, since then, there's been the anthology, and so uh, we invited authors to come in and write the backstories of all these Vikings that uh, are in the game are fictional, and that was an incredible experience. I got to be the editor on that and just to kind of um, have all the colors sort of filled in and 
and the background uh, come in was was rewarding for me, and, and I know a lot of players enjoyed that too. Um, so the, we got the expansion coming out. Um, Caitlin Felix, who wrote for the anthology and, and who I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. uh, is writing a full novelization of one of the right. characters. And so there's going to be a full-length novel uh, based on one of the characters, Gita the Grim. And if you have not played the game, Gita the Grim is, I would say, one of the most memorable illustrations. I, I love her by name, and uh, what Caitlin has done with that character is absolutely incredible um there are uh, there is a, 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 a few other things in the works um uh, it hasn't been officially announced yet but uh, uh I, I can sort of tease a little bit and say look forward to a brand new game in the all thing okay. universe coming up soon and uh, uh uh potentially we've got one or two other projects um kind of on the go as well so um um with creative things it's always you know when, when it gets to be published you know it's out in the open that's awesome there's always three or four things kind of happening in the background and um the saga of heroes is super exciting and it's definitely not the last thing you're going to see from uh, uh the all thing universe there's there's lots more uh coming to explore the world and expand the narrative uh introduce new characters and uh new ways of kind of stepping into that era mm-hmm. so firing on all cylinders okay and let me get just get this straight. We have Ultingi, One Will Rise, which is the, the card game. We have Saga Heroes, right. which is the expansion. We have the anthology series. What's what's the it called again? Northern Star, correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We've got the novelization coming out from Katie. And then the uh, unannounced projects, or uh, yet to be revealed projects, I should say. Yeah, and then there's there's a new game coming out. Yeah, and it's 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 separate from uh, All Things One Will Rise. I can't say too much about it yet, mm-hmm. but it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to announcing that hopefully in the new year. So okay, I'm not gonna pry any more on that. <laughs> um, any indication on 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 when the novelization will come out? Yeah, we're hoping for uh, mid to late 2023 for the for the novelization. We're kind of uh, uh, nearing the end of the uh, of the, the first draft um, uh, editing stages. I've been uh, uh, invited on board as editor for that project as well, and it's been it's been amazing. Katie's such an amazing author. Her vision for the character and her knowledge of uh, you know historical Europe at the time uh, is, is is just amazing. She's just able to sort of drop us right in per- first person view. Uh, and Gita's gritty. You just can't not love her. Um, it's uh, you know she just is so feisty and fights for. She wants, and so it really captures, I think, some of that uh, uh, the tenacity of the Viking spirit. Mm-hmm. And so we have games, books. Any interest beyond that? Any interest in digital games and video games, or is this going to be kind of like a tabletop experience mostly? That's a great question. And uh, uh, without saying too much, one of the things I'd love to see uh, grow, I think, um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, like some sort of like uh, comic book or graphic novel series could be mm-hmm. a really interesting addition to the um, to the universe. And uh, uh, then, um, yeah, uh, we uh, yeah, I, yeah, and I'm I'm always tongue tied on this a little bit, but we've we've also been approached by um, uh, by a few different um, several different organizations about maybe even some sort of film adaptations for okay. the. Uh, uh, for the anthology, which uh, which once again, if you're in the publishing industry, you know that that, that it's you know that sort of thing is super exciting. You know, for every you know um, a letter of interest you get, you know, mm-hmm. there's probably like a three percent chance it'll actually happen. But even the fact that there's interest there is 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 super exciting. And to be honest, if there was ever some sort of film adaptation of the of the anthology and bringing these characters to life in the real screen, I I, I would probably just fall over and die and say, oh, there we go. Yeah. Well, that's that, that's great. But uh, anyways, can't promise too much. But um, there is a lot of cool energy and obviously interest in this era, interest in the in the world and. As, as the creator, it feels like it's really grown beyond something. It's not just mine anymore. Um, obviously, bringing those other creators in, it's sort of a, a community of creators who are um, almost like an RPG, actually, now that I'm kind of mm-hmm. thinking about it, right, are kind of adding to the story and, and filling in elements of the characters and, and building up bridges. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's also a new artist coming on board for the for the game, and so uh, I'm looking forward to working with him. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, once again, more on that later. I wish I could give you more, but uh, it's still, we're kind of finalizing the details of launch and all that kind of stuff. So um, anyways, I, all I can say is stay tuned <laughs> yeah a lot a lot to, to look out for and it seems kind of like you're the kevin feige the architect of like the old thing is cinematic <laughs> universe the expanded universe which is which is very exciting um, totally we, yeah go on we, we've yet to reach marvel level but you never know one day maybe there'll be yeah <laughs> you know comic books the first the first step in that process you know yeah. um you mentioned the north man and different you know and 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 different other like games movies that like have like you know pick up Norse myth and, you know, an interest in, like, Vikings, like, you know, Go of War, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I asked you with One Will Rise how things are different, and, you know, and we spoke about how, like, you want to portray Vikings in an accurate manner. Um, will your next projects also stay true to this philosophy? And I'm imagining the answer is yes, but I kind of would like you to elaborate more on, like, how, how will it be different than Vikings, the TV show, than 
other adaptations that you know Norse mythology by Neil Gaiman, other like Viking media we we seeing at the at the moment. Yeah. So the all thing is sort of like our 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 my sort of vision for all thing is always like Vikings and so it's never just Vikings, okay. right? Um, so the original game was like Vikings and historical accuracy. Saga Heroes is Vikings and a spotlight on the on Icelandic sagas. Um, the uh, anthology was when she was Vikings and. Uh, Muslims, which mm -hmm. if that catches you off guard, um, uh, it caught a lot of people off guard. Uh, but historically, anybody who's got a, a sense of you know European history knows that the the golden age of Islam and the golden age of uh, sort of Viking exploration right. um, almost completely coincide. Um, uh, and uh, there was there's uh, you know um, uh, manuscript references on both sides, both from the Viking sagas and from Arabic manuscripts about interactions. And so we explored that. Um, uh, Caitlin Felix's novel delves into several things, but, but one of the big highlights in her novel is Vikings in Ireland and how the uh, okay. Okay. Uh, story happens there. Um, uh, one of the things I'm hoping to explore, um, if if we do get to go ahead to do some sort of graphic novels, I'd love to explore sort of in the in line with the Vinland sagas is Vikings and you know North America. There was interactions between um, uh, uh, first peoples of, uh, uh, of Arctic Canada and the Vikings, um, uh, and uh, there's also speculation as to what sort of interactions they would have had um, further down the coast. And so um, yeah, but always that sort of Vikings and. Um, in terms of uh, you know what might differentiate it from like a TV series like uh, History Vikings um, or or The Northmen is um, the world is connected a little bit. So once you enter the world, you can kind of start to mm -hmm. um, expand and explore. Uh, I, I, whether you know Bernard Cornwall writes this uh, you know epic series and the the TV show is is kind of loosely based off off of that. Um, so you're, you're kind of stepping into a different world there. Um, yeah, what it differentiates it, I would say we're all kind of like chipping away at the same. Uh, you know, we're using a lot of the same historical material. We might even be like using some of the same characters, but everybody has a different perspective to offer, right? So um, I think what Vikings history did for Viking, you know, interest in research was really interesting. I don't think that's the only show mm -hmm. that ever needs to come out about about yeah. Vikings. The Northmen was a little bit uh, polarizing. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. I, I really appreciated the contribution um, it had both visually and sort of narratively. Um, uh, so it's shown who's a uh, uh, Icelandic poet was uh, worked with Robert Eggers to sort of create the, the mm -hmm. script for it. And there's actually a great episode. Um, I should maybe uh, back reference and link to a saga thing again. Um, they do a great interview with uh, uh, with uh, Robert Eggers and, and Sean on um, it's sort of the process of creating that story and, and sort of taking the myths and adapting them. But but that's just it. And I say this in the preface to my first book um, is that, you know, the Norse myths for me in particular, kind of this, I just can't stop, you know, thinking about them and where I'm working with them. And I think it's the job of every, every generation. And this might tie into the historical conversation to sort of to uncover, to dust off, to re, uh, not reinvent, but sort of rediscover um, the myths and what they mean to us, uh, uh, maybe rediscover history and what, what history can teach us. There's new lessons all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, do you think you'll ever come to a point where, like, you'll leave Vikings behind and you'll move on to tackle a different beast, a different project altogether? Or is this my kind of what you'll you'll be writing for the foreseeable future? I don't think I'll ever leave Vikings behind. I think I'll always have some sort of Viking, um, uh, you know, project on the go. Uh, my new fantasy uh, uh, trilogy that I'm starting now that I've finished my first trilogy uh, is going to be set uh, um, in a fantasy realm, uh, but inspired by the French Revolution and the Golden Age of Piracy. Okay. And so that's been a bit of a fresh, uh, uh, a fresh slate of um, you know historical sources and um, uh, and characters to explore. And so I, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to doing that. But there will always be a part of my heart that's just you know in in, in Scandinavia in the frigid winter, you know, drinking mead in a hall mm -hmm. uh, uh, and some frozen fjord, right? So, um, yeah, I don't think they'll ever not be like a project on the go for me, but I'm looking forward to sort of expanding and, and, and uh, growing. For me, a part of this is just, you know, uh, I'm not just trying to produce a game that's a commercial product here. Like, I'm, I, I love learning about the history. It's, it's such an interesting puzzle and challenge for me to sort of present it in game form. And I learned so much as I kind of delve into these projects, so. Mm -hmm. And now as we get into the final segment of the, of the podcast, I know you have a lot of things cooking uh but i want to ask you is there anything else any other projects that you can tell us about what comes next for you either personally professionally what's what's next for you joshua that's a great question. So, um, so yeah, I, I've got this new trilogy ahead of me that I'm really looking forward to. Um, sort of inspired by pirates in the French Revolution. Uh, I've, I've, there's a f many things cooking with uh, uh, with all thingy. We've got Katie's novel. We've got the new game. Uh, a few other things. And at this point in the time, you know, when I was first starting uh, uh, to create games and write books, I was really just looking for a foothold, right? You know, just just desperate to kind of like mm -hmm. yeah, get that first book published. You know, get that game out there. And um, uh, I'm reaching a stage where I'm um, sort of feeling like you know i've i've been established kind of in in the game community and, and in writing and it's uh almost like 
the Saga Heroes expansion, having something to kind of work off of. Now I, I have a bit of a footing and, and I can kind of explore from there. So um, I don't want to take um, that for granted. I want to um, uh, kind of, as I continue to move forward, sort of sort of build off of that. But for me, for now, I think it's, uh, you know, finding a sustainable um, pace of work for, you know, working on the books and working on the, uh, on the games and keeping all the plates spinning at the same time without adding too much. I obviously have a lot of energy, but that energy is finite and uh, lots of, lots of things going on family wise and stuff too. So just finding that balance. It's really sad for me to see um, creative folks kind of hit a wall or mm -hmm. burn out on creative projects. And I've seen, I've been around long enough to see a few authors, a few game designers sort of come bursting onto the scene with these smashing successes and then just totally burn out and come crashing to the ground and drop off the scene altogether um, with a lot of, you know, bad and hard feelings, uh, maybe against their their readership or maybe against the, the fans or their publisher and just sort of throw their hands up and walk away. And I hope to be creating games and writing books, you know, uh, for the rest of my life. So uh, finding that sort of balance and sustainability, I think is going to be the challenge for me now. I've got that sort of initial foot in the door and now it's about sort of, you know, how do I continue to, to, to do that sustainably? Yeah, fantastic. And wishing you, you know, the, the very best. Uh, I asked you last time you were on the podcast if you had any piece of advice for people wanting to get into game design. And I'd like to ask you again to kind of just get a sense of like how things have changed for you. So like not knowing what you know, what would you tell, you know, students or like, you know, people like me or like who are, you know, younger with no gaming design experience, what would you what would be the first thing you would you would tell them and why? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, kind of given the benefit of hindsight now, um, and this is something I think I knew earlier on, but I maybe just hadn't formally um, kind of put together in my head, is that, um, you know, it's uh, uh, putting yourself out there is hard and the things you create is hard, uh, but that's, uh, uh, you know, it can also be um, uh, super rewarding. Um, as you're building your, your games and creating your projects, you need the passion. The passion is kind of the spark that starts it, but as you sort of develop, and I've talked with a few author friends about this, you really need to create um, a bit of a, a safe distance between your project and yourself. So uh, a lot of times when people come up with their first board game idea, they put it on the table, it's like, this is their heart and soul just like poured into this game and seeing it on the table brings them such joy. But of course the flip side of that is, you know, if it doesn't go well, if people don't enjoy it, they just mm -hmm. feel personally crushed and devastated. And so um, uh, it's easy to say, and it's hard to do, but as a, as a designer that's had a few projects kind of um, up and running and kind of run the gauntlet of that process is uh, yeah, work, work on that, um, you know, um, uh, keep the passion, don't, you know, um, snuff it out. You're not just like, creating some packaged product for people to buy. You're, you're really pouring your heart and your soul into something. But then again, when it's on the table, when it's out there, um, just remember it's artistic value um, up to you and how much you enjoy it. Even if uh, it doesn't always, uh, isn't always received the way you want it to or is with a, as much excitement, keep at it because persistence is the only trait or factor that you know will consistently uh, uh bring you success in this industry you know you can be talented you can be charismatic you can be you know lucky um uh, but all those things sort of come and go persistence is the one thing you have control of um, um keep at it and just yeah don't give up that's great advice thank you so much let me now uh, tell our listeners and watchers about you know the history in games lab what's going on with, with what we do so as you may have noticed, we've taken a long break from these podcast episodes, but as the new academic year dawns, we do also hope that there will be more on the way. Similarly, we will indeed have more seminars and, and guest talks in the near future, all of which will be announced in the weeks to come as plans are finalized. Last year, we had, you know, everyone come and, and talk to us about, like, you know, civilization. We had someone talk about Dante's Inferno. We had some really interesting talks, and we can't wait to show you what we have slated for the, for the new academic year. Until then... If you have any feedback or would like to get in touch for a potential podcast appearance, our DMs are open on Twitter at HNGLab, or you can email us at HNGLabPodcast at gmail.com. Again, don't worry if, if this is hard to understand. All of the links will be in the description. For more on the History and Games Lab, please access our link tree link, where you will find all of our outputs, output plus our social media. We are currently preparing a few projects that I can't really speak about, but I am excited for what's to for what's to come. In any case, um, Joshua, where ca where could our listeners find more about you? I have your Twitter handle uh, for those who, uh, of you who are watching on YouTube. But where else could we could we find more about you? Fantastic. So yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter for a bit. The best place to find about me and my project is my website, which is joshuagillingham.ca. And uh, all my books, all my games, all the projects and uh, wild things that are going on in my life are uh, accessible there. So uh, yeah, if you like Vikings, um, if you like um, uh, Icelandic history, if you like the Norse myths, uh, that's definitely a spot for you to check out. Perfect. And 
what would you like to emphasize if if there's one thing you would like our listeners and and viewers to to take away from this podcast what what would that be I think in all my work, the one thing that is sort of consistent throughout is that, um, you know, uh, uh, history is never simple. It's always worth reexamining. And that, you know, we need to continually be in a process of sort of uh, examining our biases and asking ourselves what our values are, um, uh, looking back, you know, for inspiration, but also sort of looking ahead uh, as to, you know, you know, we're, we're going to be the myths and legends of, of, you know, some future generations. So what do we want them to remember about us? So, yeah, there we go. I'll leave it with that. That's perfect. Once again, thank you so much, Joshua, for joining me. This has been the latest episode of the podcast. Until next time, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. The Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast is a production of the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. For more on us and future podcasts, connect to us on Twitter, Instagram, and or Facebook by searching for Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. We should be the first result. Music for today's episode is Call to Adventure by Kevin McLeod used under filmmusic.io standard license. For more information on the link and the license, please check the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join us next time.